This is episode 17 of Hoops Forum, a joint effort of Radius Athletics and a quick timeout podcast. I'm Tony Miller, and I'm joined again by my co-host, Randy Sherman. Before we get going, big thanks to 323 Sports for sponsoring Hoops Forum. It's getting down to crunch time here. If you haven't already ordered your camp t-shirts, now is the time to do that. 323 Sports has a moisture management one-color print tee for $6.99 a piece. You can get those ordered today by simply visiting 323sports.com or you can contact a rep sales at 323sports.com. They'll be sure to do it right for your sports camp. All right, the offseason's here. We've talked a little bit about, from a coach's perspective, what you should be doing or the things that you should be thinking about or things that maybe you're already thinking about. And we hopefully gave you some tips that you can you can follow and things regarding film, regarding planning. Now we're going to talk today a little bit about player workouts. This is something, Randy, that I even started doing this week. Um, let's go ahead and start like big picture with – um, well, I, actually, what were your, what are the rules there in Texas or when you were coaching in regards to players and summer workouts? Um, well, they, they've since changed since I left coaching, but, uh, during the spring, let's start with the spring. I'm talking about the time from when season ends until school is out. Um, most, most schools in Texas have an athletic period during the school day where athletes come and work with their coaches for an hour a day. So um, that, that, was, that, was, um, that was a big part of, of, of our sort of macro calendar, if you will. Um, summer, when I actually coached, was um, strength and conditioning only. Coaches weren't allowed to interact with players around like sports tactics and things like that. Um, it was focus mainly on strength and conditioning. So um, that's since changed in, in, here in Texas, but, um, you know, that varies from state to state. I talked to coaches from a lot of uh, places and, and their summer um, workouts are, are a big part of their calendar um, for in, the, in some other locales. So for me, let's, let's talk about spring first, the, the period of time from when the season ends uh, till school dismisses to me was all about like what we're going to talk about today, the individual player. Um, it's going to be a long time until we play another meaningful game until the next November. And so to me, that was a time to sort of suppress a little bit of the team tactics, the, the, you know, learning plays and sets and all of that. Um, and, and sort of dial up the importance of, okay, this is, this is player focused time. And, and my two biggest things during spring were individual player development and, and, and uh, strength and conditioning. So those, those were the two biggest prongs during this time of the year. Um, for, for the summer, again, I was constrained by rules to, to it just be about um, strength and conditioning. But that's since changed here in Texas. But I, I would say that most – I would guess most coaches are kind of uh, – they're on board now with the strength and conditioning, even like 10 years ago, a lot of them, either the excuses of we don't have a weight room, we don't have a workout program, we don't have a strength conditioning coach, I don't know what I'm doing, Mm -hmm. feel like the to an extent, those have been those excuses, you have to put those aside. Now, there's so many even technological things that can be done. We this last year with the COVID and being separate in part, weren't able to get into places, but you still have whether it's through like Volt or something like that, an app, you can send your players workouts. I, you know, for our rules with Division Three, we can't do anything with our players. Yeah, but we can have a strength conditioning coach or somebody give them or have a, the captains lead a program that's all virtual. Um, and that's the thing too. I, I get responses from coaches like, "Well, if I give my players something to do, like most of them won't do it." <laughs> well, that, that your playing time's optional as well too, right? Or yeah. how do I know that they're doing it or not? And you just yeah. look at look at your players. Are they bigger? Are they stronger? <laughs> right. Are they faster? I think it's so. I feel like the excuses have been kind of done away with at this point. Yeah, I feel I feel like too that that um, so much of it is injury prevention. So much of it is is uh, is um, you know just being prepared to play the sport. The 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 physicality of the sport, the speed of the sport. It this is a vital component of any serious program. Sorry, yeah. not if yeah. that yeah. is wrong. It sounds bad, but like, um, you know, the, I, I've written about this extensively. Um, you know, there's four areas in which 
we we are seeking constant improvement. You know, one one is uh, competitiveness. One is basketball IQ or basketball intelligence, if you will. Another one is skill. Another one is athleticism. Um, so if you think about like why you might lose a game or why you might lose a team, it's because of a deficiency in one or more of those four areas. So every day when I get in my vehicle and go to work, my, my mission is to increase our level, if you will, in all of those four categories, athleticism being one of them. Mm -hmm. So this time of year when the competitive season is far away, we don't play a meaningful game again until November. I turn the dial all the way up on, on increasing player individual skill and incre increasing our athleticism individually and as a group. That's good. All right. We'll talk more about kind of some ways to go about doing that. Let me talk. I think you kind of just touched on this, but like big picture plan, your big picture plan is more on the individual versus the team. At this right. point in the year. Yes. Yeah. Um, I kind of focus like, so we'll just quickly hit, hit the macro calendar, if you will. So I kind of considered when we get back from spring break as like the beginning of next year's team's calendar. That's our new year's day. Right. So that we're, we're spending that time on, on athleticism and skill development uh, throughout the summer as well. Again, a lot of this is constrained by rules. This varies from state to state. I can only relay my experiences. So that, when and and so spring and summer are about the individual both skill athletic development we might do a team camp during the summer where where there could be some brief polishing up on you know tactics and 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 things like that but um again i don't really care about those games so i'm not doing you know a whole lot for them um and and then you know school reconvenes in the fall that's when I sort of started doing team preparatory stuff, you know, a, a balancing of we're still going to be addressing athleticism. We're still going to be dress, um, addressing player development, but mostly in a context of of our offense in that in that uh, part of the calendar and any other part of the calendars as well. And then as season approaches, obviously, the attention attention then turns to to game preparation. Um, you know, film and, and, and all that, all that goes into winning games. So that's, that's a, that's a really brief summary of sort of the macro cycle, if you will. So for us again, you know, with, with it being so limited from the college D3 perspective, can't really do much with your players after the season is over, but it's mm -hmm. still preparing them postseason wise so that they understand what's expected of them. And, and go ahead and start lifting and getting bigger and faster and stronger. Um, but then as the off season and summer months come preparing yeah. them for what they need to be doing on their own, I would say this to your players and it needs to be something that they understand their parents understand they need to own their own game. That's a phrase we use a lot with our players. Mm -hmm. Too much is thrown on the coaches. Like what will you do to improve my players? Once they get to the weight room, what will you do to improve my players? Once they get to practice, and there are so many, again, tools available that you're behind if that's the only time that you're working out or on the court or whatever. Yeah. But the coaches should also give them the tools that they need. And so that kind of moves us into the next phase here. Structure of an off-season workout, whether you're there as a coach or they're on their own, what kinds of things, even to those four points that you mentioned earlier, how can they be improving in those four areas, whether you're there or not? Yeah, so I, I do kind of like divide it up mentally, like you're like you're alluding to here, is like whether it's a supervised workout by me, or it's like open gym or or something like that. So I'm a big believer in free play. Like just um, I, I I felt like um, you know so much of of our of our time when I coached you know during spring and or during summer particularly was was we weren't allowed to direct workouts, but I could open the gym just almost like a rec center, right? Like open it up. And, and so we, we really spent time teaching our players and this sounds weird, but like teaching them how to play pickup games, like, you know, straight up or by two, or, you know, like all the things, you know, uh, all the things that go into that pickup culture. I, I wanted our players to develop um, and, and play. There's, there's really, so much value I see there. 
from just free play, just playing ball. And I, I don't get too worried about what it looks like and, and, and things like that. Just, just playing pickup games. Um, so that was a big component. Again, some of that was by rule. The individual, the, the workouts for skill development, I would say that to me always began with our style of play. So, so I look at our, I look at our style of play and unpack sort of what do we need to be really good at to make this way of playing optimal or, or, or super effective. So uh, everything tied back to that. So if it's, um, you know, catch and shoot threes, we're going to do a lot of that um, footwork, um, footwork, um, things like that. Um, how to start a drive, how to stop a drive. And, and our, in our workouts were, were a lot centered upon the individual player as far as like uh, within the context of the offense and within what's really important to our offense for it to excel uh, and, and function optimally. I would say, too, that you need to consider how many players you have at your workout. Absolutely. Like I, I, too many coaches go in with this plan and then it doesn't necessarily work with the group that you have. And then even based off of that, we even ask on our poll this week, like what what would you if I came to one of your workouts, like what would I what would I see? What would I primarily see with that? Um, pull it up here. Yeah. The, the three, I only gave three, which it could be some other things involved, but like on air drill work, games based or just fundamental skill okay. work. Okay. For me, it was kind of a trick question. You would see probably all three of those in mind. The first one gets the fewest amount of votes because everybody hates today. The, the It's just kind of like in vogue to hate on air drill work. But there's a big problem if there's only one person in the gym and I'm approaching 38 years old and I'm not getting out there and going one on one with a kid. That's not much pushback. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's not going to be much challenge to them. But what else are you going to do if you've only got one kid in right. the gym to, uh, that you're working out with? So how can you get creative? And I think it goes back. We can address this later, but it goes back to how can I still make this competitive? I think that's a real huge one that. Coaches are all asking for, but they don't necessarily know how to do it. And when the kids aren't, they just get mad at the kids. Yeah. I think that's more of a coach's fault than it is a player's fault, but that's different. Um, so on air work, you'll see sometimes in, in my workouts, mm -hmm. games based. If I have two two available, then we're going to one on one. If I have you know yeah. six available, it may even be big enough. You can go three on three. Um, mm -hmm. There are plenty of disadvantage and advantage so key phrases that we've used for weeks sure. on the show, but like you can do, you have an odd number of kids, like two on two on three, three on two, whatever. And then two, I think, I don't think there's anything wrong with the fun of cones and tennis balls get bad raps on Twitter at I, age group two, the number of kids, the ages that I have of players. We talk about making practices fun and practical, but even for younger kids, they like gimmicks. So I'll, I'll be more than happy to get throw a few gimmicks at cones at them and, you know, tennis balls at them every right. now and then, but not literally throw them at them. But, um, <laughs> but like, you know, how, how can I, the bigger picture here, how many kids do I have? Mm -hmm. What are their ages? Correct. And then how can I make this fun and practical and game like? Because I, I do want them getting competitive and understanding how to compete and also having decision making practice within that. So, you know, those are my, my bigger thoughts for, for coaches as they kind of prepare. I don't know if you have any additional thoughts to that. Yeah, when I look at this poll, I, I'm sort of reminded of, of of maybe drill progression, like like how, especially like today what we're talking about a player development drill where we're maybe focusing on like an individual skill, you know, like a, uh, you know, some sort of pivot or how we started, you know, go off the catch right into a drive. So we're talking about footwork or something like that. Like could be tons of examples. Could be we're learning how to set and receive a ball screen. But I, I like to follow a certain progression for all skills. And, and, and this, this chart here or this poll, poll um, reflects sort of like the progression I like to follow. So, um, you know, the first phase would be introducing a new skill and a tactic on air. We're dialing down any defensive infer interference so we can focus on technique. So on air, all my coaching corrections and interjections would sound like, no, your foot needs to be here, right here, or, or squash the bug with your foot when you pivot or, you know, things like technique driven things. I'm not, I'm, I'm not, um, I'm not 
making any predictions that this is going to transfer to the game. I'm just wanting to introduce and put the focal point on technique when I'm working on air. And once the technique's been demonstrated, I'll advance that drill. Maybe with a guided defense would be next. So if we're working on that rip through into a drive, I'll, I'll have, a, have a defender kind of guide them, guide that defender to say, uh, you know, let the ball through and, and rip and then contest the shot or something like that. And, and then, and then advance that one more level. Say, okay, we're going to go 1v1 one 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 live off the catch. That moves it up to game-like. So this phasing thing is something that once you know this formula as a coach, I just applied it to different skills. So maybe we're going to learn. we got four players. We're going to work on a little pick and roll. So we're going to start two on O and work on screening angles, how to set it up, how to, how to come off hip to hip, all the technique things on air. And then maybe we'll advance at one level and say, okay, now let's go 2v1, guard the ball handler, either go under. If we go under, I want you to rescreen. If he goes over, just use the, just accept the screen. So I'm giving them a guided defender and, a, and an if-then decision to go with it. And then ultimately I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put another defender out there and we're going to read the, read, the, read the guy guarding the screener. Does he drop? Is he up? Is he down? Did they trap and, and apply all this context? So keep walking different skills through that progression pathway of introduce for technique on air, give a guided, um, a guided if then type decision based um, component in that middle layer, and then take it to life. That's, that's, that's a formula I've followed pretty much religiously. Uh, that's good. Uh, there was one question that when you mentioned this, I was kind of interested too, in the, you know, p- teaching them to play games uh, question. Do you like, you know, teaching okay. how to how to play pickup games. Yeah, yeah. Um, I do think those two sometimes get a bad rep. Like we just think the kids are in there just messing around. They don't necessarily get any better. But there can be a strategic way, maybe to play pickup games. So, uh, Coach Wiggins asked, do you do you give them like a sheet with pickup game info? I have heard of coaches doing that before, but maybe even what's on the sheet, or do you just teach them through like session work each week? What do you do during how to play those games? Yeah, I, I kind of just, um, at least on the front end, until this culture has been developed in the program, uh, taught them in open gym. Like, you know, I mean, hopefully you have a few kids who know how to play, make it, take it, you know, straight up ones and twos, by, you know, by sevens, a seven oh skunk, you know, all that culture of pickup. If not, I introduce it all to them. I did a lot of it in open gym. Uh, that might be borderline coaching, but I'm just teaching them how to play freely. Um, there are, there are some, uh, house rules that we kind of follow to keep, to keep pickup games sort of moving along and, and, uh, and, uh, co- and keep their quality from deteriorating. So for example, um, I didn't like guys arguing over our, our guys or girls arguing over, um, you know, who's, who, who's going to call the foul offense or defense. So we tended to say you know, offense, call your own fouls. Um, Didn't like players arguing over, you know, stopping down to talk about if um, who, who, who the ball went off if it goes out of bounds. So we made a simple rule. Any ball out of bounds always goes to the defense period. No questions asked. Ball goes out of bounds, defense ball. Um, And um, you know, other things that some of the, the coaches, my membership group have, have shared, um, you know, making sure that like, say when, when, like say a team scores all four or five or whatever members of their team need to be on that half of the court. So there's nobody just jogging and hanging back and not playing engaged full court, uh, validating a win with a free throw, things like that. I have, I have seen some of the guys in my group have made like posters that they've shared that, um, that they get, you know, take to a printing company, get blown up and put on a wall that has like, house rules for pickup games. And, and, uh, so just, just think of things that, um, will, will add, preserve the quality of that from de- deteriorating into, you know, something YMCA like, <laughs> you know? Yeah. 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 I think a key to that is you mentioned it's helpful to teach your older players or to have older players so that they can teach those onto the next group. And yeah. And almost we'll- become, it almost becomes a part of like your culture rather than just more rules on a wall. Although yeah. that may be, that may be where you have to start, but over time, if you don't have that, then that would be a good idea. 
to have something like that. But hopefully it becomes a part of our culture. Like this is how we play. It almost I've heard of, of teams and programs where players will come back and this is the way we still do it. Mm-hmm. And that again, it just kind of enhances something else that you maybe didn't think that it would enhance yeah. when you when you came up with it. Yeah, so. I think I really want to do this once. Like I wanted I'll show you how to play, pick up and and introduce the the, the sort of rules and and uh you know the 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 vernacular that goes with it, make it, take it and all this stuff or, or, um, you know, shooting for teams and things that we do when we play pickup and, and I'll do that once after that, you guys self-organize. Yeah. All right. This is the portion of our show called beyond the scoreboard presented by our partners at sideline interactive during the month of May here, only about 6,600 plus shipping for a 10 foot digital, uh, scoring table, incredible deal. Um, you can, you can potentially earn up to or even more than $10,000 in sponsorship revenue. So it pays itself back very quickly. They even offer a two year school year, no fee, no interest financing option, which, which makes it more of a possibility, even more of a possibility for a lot of programs out there. So be sure to act quickly on this deal ends May 31st. If you're interested, click the link below. You can visit that at sidelineinteractive.com as well. All right. As we discussed in our previous episodes about offensive schemes, We've made comments kind of off the cuff, like these schemes can be the best schemes ever created, but if your players can't execute with fundamental skills, you're not going to have good offense. Mm -hmm. So what's the best way of going about with the player development that enhances your offensive schemes? In other words, what would you consider your workout essentials? Again, like I mentioned, alluded to a a moment ago, is to me it all begins with style of play. Uh, wh- how do we play as a program? And offenses are similar across the spectrum of what what teams run and what teams do, but but they're subtly different. So so um, I like to pluck out of our offense. What are the priority skills? And let me give you let's give me let me just give an example to maybe drive home what I mean by a priority skill. So let's say we're going to be a motion offense like Bob Knight, Rick Majerus family of like a lot of, you know, screener cutter passer, you know, stuff like that. Like, so in that particular offense, which is all pretty much all off ball screening, back screens, down screens, flare screens, pin screens, all of that stuff. um, That's a priority skill. Our ability to set up, use, read, shoot coming off of screens is like if we're going to play this way and play it well that our guys have to do that so our player development drills might be just little microcosms of that got maybe we we introduce with a guy you know coming off of a, a screen on air to just to get the footwork or or the the you know learn to pivot into a shot correctly and learn how to set up a screen correctly then we'll again walk it through that pathway of progression um so to me, it begins with what is needed to play this way optimally. So if um, this this helps me know what to ignore, which I think is very important in this day and age with the information that's all available to us. If we're going to be a dribble drive team where where there's there may be zero off ball or ball screens in our offense, like it's all cutting, passing, driving. Well, what are our what do we need to play this way? successfully we got to be able to start a drive we got to be able to stop a drive and we got to hit that catch and shoot three off when we when we punch the paint and kick it out if we can't hit that then what are we here what are we what are we even doing right so the 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 way we want to play and what that way needs to function optionally informs my player development program i think the best example of this is when i watch villanova play they're a team that's like their offense is very similar from year to year. They don't really reinvent themselves every spring. You know, they, they do a lot of the same things. And all of their teaching stems from their spacing and what they're trying to accomplish in terms of shot profile. So you'll see players who are very good at using shot fakes into a drive. They, they graduate and move on. And then the new players that replace them look the same. They all can shot fake and use a drive and dribble into a post up and come to good jump stops because this, this, this is informed by their style of play. And it's, and it's, and it's just oozed into the way they play there. So, so to me, it all begins with that and identifying what is needed to play this particular way optimally if i was a ball screen continuity team and we're going to be 
hitting side ball screens over and over again in our offense. Well, my player development should probably entail the, the detailed usage of that action and, and us being able to function within it optimally, make the right reads, make the right passes that we need to make. So, so having a highly identifiable style that informs my player development program. I would say going back to your point about even like the competitiveness of it and the overall picture, bigger picture of maximizing your time. Mm -hmm. How can I do all of the things that you just mentioned while building competitiveness and while using the, using my time as best I can. Here's my point. I hear a lot of coaches or I hear even a lot of players say to me, I was in the gym the other day for four hours. And my thought process is like, what are you doing in the gym for four hours? Like get in the gym work as hard as you can, do everything that you just said right there, and then get out of the gym, but maximize your time. I see too many videos and whatnot on social media, which is not fair because it's just clips of things. So it, it may be some a part of a bigger picture that I just don't see, but they're doing some isolated skill that takes five or 10 minutes where they could be doing that same thing while doing the things that you just mentioned to me. So instead of instead of breaking down things so individually that you're you're only doing one thing, how can I maximize my time by doing these other other things with it that will also benefit the team as well? I think there's just like a fine balance between like so individual versus so team oriented. Yeah. And it goes to what the point that you just made there. Like, how can I make these players better? Because it, you know, on a on a foundational level your offense is only going to be as good as your individuals are but also getting them to understand or even being able to play within that offense so finding the the balance between that and then again helping our players learn and become more competitive so that we can translate that better into a game yeah and for me a lot of that took took me sort of like either either learning from coaches who who played with a similar style and and asking them about drills and the way they break things down or just simply creating some of some, some activities of my own that, that I feel like I can kill two birds with one stone. If I make small unit drills, two on two, two on O, one on O that, that also are a microcosm of our offense as a whole. So, so we're still learning something that we may not apply in a team tactical way until November, but, but I'm learning the individual component of it in, in workouts. So like I see drills sometimes where, you know, some shooting drill where it's, you know, elbow jumpers coming off of a, a pass from the coach and, you know, someone else circles to the same spot and you know, you're getting shots up and you're getting things like that. But like, to me, it, that, and, and that has value. Uh, but to me, I would like to devise something that felt the same, that accomplished the same volumes of shots, but also mimic something we're doing in our offense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would say too, like maximum reps. So what you just mentioned there, but allowing them to get as many reps as possible. I think that's a good, again, maximizing your time there, but how do I get them as many reps as possible doing whatever action or skill or whatever is needed within your offense? Um, so anyways. Yeah. Uh, so there too, I think that comes down to a lot of, of uh, a veteran coach who's uh, learned to sort of like coach in phrases and sound bites and not stopping down and given a footwork clinic every time somebody uses the wrong pivot foot or didn't, you know, didn't establish how you want their feet on the catch, like coach on the fly, let the, let the, let the drill or the activity keep moving. But, but like while, while you're running the drill, Hey, Johnny, watch that pivot foot, you know, like, you know, like keep the thing moving and not stop down to deliver, you know, footwork clinics at every mistake. Right. Right. All right. So kind of summarize it as we kind of wrap things up here. Summarize for me your keys to having a successful offseason program. My keys would be uh, would be first strength and conditioning. That's all measurable. Did we get did we get bigger, faster, stronger, more athletic? Did our testing improve? That's all that that's a big key for off season. We, we don't have a game for a while. We don't have to worry about being sore, being fatigued, whatever we can, we can really hammer 
this this vital component to winning. Are we athletic enough to compete? So so to me, I'm looking at the numbers there. Like, did those did did our players generally improve in those areas? And they they should. And um, I would say from the basketball perspective, is um, <clears throat> would be are 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 the habits that we introduce in our player development activities drills for you know on air middle phase live phase are they am i seeing them more in gameplay in open gym in when i go watch one of my players compete in an aau tournament or something like that like like i i'm a mavericks fan i watch jalen brunson who no longer plays for villanova but still barkley still jump stops josh hart same thing like those have seeped into their player DNA. That's what I'm looking for to determine whether it was a success or not. You can trick me in the drill. You can drill the drill, mm -hmm. right? But like, if I go watch you play for another coach in an AAU tournament in a showcase event and I see jump stop, pivot, kick out, chase, whatever, like I see those habits, I know this was an effective program because this has seeped into your player profile. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, there, there, there have been times where I like watch a team play and that's, I think that's probably another good reason why you can have those off season, um, you know, team going playing in a team camp or playing in those off season games. Don't necessarily use those as just, let me see what I have for next year, but as an evaluation time to see are the things that we're working on in our off season program yeah. actually translating and changing who they are fundamentally as a player versus, oh, yeah, I think he's gotten a little bit better. Like, if you're not seeing the things that you're working on in practice, then what have you what have you accomplished in those off-season workouts? Yeah, and we, we, like I said, we can drill the drill. We can, they can gain the drill and demonstrate proficiency in a drill. But when, when the, the uh, arousal level of the game arrives, are those habits still there? Like, we, 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 we uh, default to the level of our training, if you will, like, like once, once, once the competitive juices get flowing in the game, is this this player's habit? And it may, and it doesn't happen like that, right? It doesn't happen like, oh, all all of a sudden they do everything like we taught in one game. It, it trickles in, right? It it I see him jump stopping a little more. I see him, you know, I see him, uh, you know, shot mechanics being quicker than they used to be because we've worked on that or whatever. I'm seeing it. Not all the time, but more often, and that's 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 we're moving along that growth curve, which is where we want. Yeah, uh, I'll put it in three word or three steps. First one is just simply to have a plan. I think too many people that plan is we're going to get better this off season. So have a specific plan of things that you do want to get better at. Mm -hmm. Evaluate your plan, whether that's through games or open gym or whatever. And then just simply a third one is just make adjustments to that within our individual workouts. We need to be working now yeah. more on this. We need to be, we need to get rid of this. We need to, whatever it is. So um, make it simple, but, you know, make it something that is measurable so that when you come back the next year, you can evaluate whether or not the plan, the off season was actually worthwhile or not. Awesome. So, That's great yeah. advice. Yes. All right. Uh, appreciate all those who joined us this week. If you missed any part of the show, you can go back and watch the full version of this on the Radius Athletics YouTube page. Uh, you can also listen to the full episodes on a Quick Timeout podcast. Just search that on any podcasting platform. You'll find the full show there. For Randy Sherman, I'm Tony Miller. Appreciate, again, all of those who joined in and watched. We'll see you again in the near future here.